Hey folks, I'm Steve, this is Colin, we're from Number 12 Cider. Today we're offering a video about making fruited ciders. A really popular thing nationally, you see them at all the, all the cideries and in liquor stores all over the place. So, and if, and if anybody else is like me, it might have started something like this, where I'm drinking a nice cider and I'm at my refrigerator thinking about trying something else as well and lo and behold, there's a box of Mango juice. Hmm, I wonder what these two taste like together, right? Yeah. Is that how it happened for you? That's, that's the elemental question right there. If I take these two elements and mix them together, what's gonna happen? Yeah, so the question is, maybe the first question is why? Why, why ever mix fruit in with cider in the first place? You got any thoughts on that, Colin? Yeah, well, I, th I think for me, the most important reason as to why you might do that is fruit will add characteristics to your cider that you might not get otherwise. Uh, as we know, a fruit often contains tannins, it might have acidity, it might have extra sweetness that you don't have with the apples. And if you have a kind of basic base juice, you want to spruce it up with a little something extra. A fruit addition is a great, a great way to do that. Yeah, and maybe if your cider is a little deficient in one of those categories, or in general, and you want it to taste a little bit more this way or a little bit more that way, it's one way to maybe improve a cider that isn't otherwise remarkable, right? right. And I would say uh, color is another big aspect of this. I mean, we have a couple different uh, versions of a cherry cider on the table here, and I would say that those are visually stunning. Yeah, when they I look see that, delicious. I wanna drink that, I wanna taste it, I wanna know what that's all about. I'm with you on that. And so here at number 12, we have 16 tap lines. We have 16, at least 16 different products on any given day. And we like to have diversity in those products. So some kind of diversity is, is uh, provided by adding fruit to a couple of your ciders. So you might wanna do that as well at home with your home cider making, add some diversity. Maybe you have just one kind of juice you're making into different kinds of ciders. This is some way to add diversity to your cider repertoire. So the question might be, um, how do you do that? So on the how, uh, I'll start by saying that experiment that I, that I had with uh, adding a little mango juice, well that's the easiest way, right? If you have juice, if you actually have juice from the fruit, right? that's the easiest way. But there are other ways to do it, right? There's plenty of ways. You, I mean, think of all the, the different forms that fruit takes as we know it, right? You can get uh, fruit, uh, fruit purees, you can get uh, fruit juice, as we have a little cherry juice here. Uh, you've got concentrates uh, that there could be store-bought. Um, you could macerate your fruit, you could blend it, you could puree it. Uh, any way that you can think of could be a good way to introduce that to your cider. Yeah, and maybe we'll give a couple of those examples. Obviously, we're gonna show you uh, the simple process of adding fruit juice to, to cider today, but a couple of examples might be, uh, well, let's say you wanna make a, a pineapple cider. You could you could chop the pineapple up into little chunks and put it in a bag, a muslin bag, mm -hmm. and, and you could set that in your cider for a period of time until the cider starts to acquire the, the pineapple flavor, right? And, and I, think, I think the smaller the chunks, you know, whether you're pureeing or cutting up into chunks or just cutting things in half, the smaller the pieces, the more fruit flavor you're going to infuse into your cider. So probably fruit juice is the ultimate um, a puree does a wonderful job of giving off, you know, as much of the flavor as you can. Um, if you're doing, you know, dried fruit, that becomes a little bit more subtle with your flavor, uh, but, can, but can be great as well. Yeah, and you could put the fruit chunks or puree instead of using a, a muslin bag, like I suggest, you could put it directly in the cider as well, right? Yeah, and I would say, you know, when you put it in the cider, you probably want to be swirling it. If it's, if it's fruit chunks or a puree in a bag, you want to be swirling it, mixing it, trying to expose as much of that uh, surface area of the fruit to the, to the cider as possible. Uh, so that's probably a daily swirling of your carboy, or it's a mixing of your tank, or it's uh, you know, kind of shaking things up on a daily or by, by daily basis, however often you can do it. 
And you, you talk about uh, doing that in the carboy, which I think brings about a natural question, maybe for our next topic here, is when? When would you add the fruit or the, or the fruit chunks or the fruit juice to your cider? Should we talk about that? Sure, all right. The first point in time that you might do that is uh, before or while the cider is actually fermenting, right? Sure, yeah, I mean, probably the easiest thing to do is add it right to your juice before you pitch your yeast, kind of blend things up so it's one uh, juice beverage, and then add your yeast and start fermenting those, those things together. And we call that, we call that a co-ferment. So you might see that term at a cidery or on a, on a, on a cider package. A co-ferment is when you ferment the apple juice and the fruit juice together. That's and, and keep in mind, we have you know a lot of sweetness in that fruit juice, so this is something the yeast will love. So it's not going to do any harm to it. It's not going to. It's actually going to make the ferment go a little bit better because you're just adding sweetness to that that uh, live yeast. And Colin, then you say uh, that we could add it before we start the ferment or after we do the initial ferment, and maybe you can address why we might do it after the initial ferment as opposed to before. Sure, so adding it in the, in the beginning, um, what you're gonna get is the sweetness of the fruit juice will ferment out and you'll have sort of the essence of that other characteristics of the fruit. Uh, it becomes a dry product, uh, no sweetness. You'll have uh, more of a wine-like subtlety of that fruit concept. Um, and if you're looking for something like that, Great, that's what you want to do. Then you want to do a cold ferment. Yeah. And one thing I'll say is, is that what we're going to do right now is we're going to start a cold ferment after that initial ferment has occurred. And if you've made cider at home, you know that that initial ferment is a really bubbly, active process. And that uh, releases a lot of aromatics from, from the product. So. In this case, the reason we're doing this co-ferment, but we waited until after the cider was mostly fermented or completely fermented, is because it'll be a more subtle re-fermentation of the fruit juice, and that will that will do what? So that so we're gonna we're just trying to maintain the aromatics as you described. So by having this more subtle secondary ferment with just the fruit juice, right? We've already gone through the roiling and the bubbling and all, and losing some of those juice aromatics from the apples. Uh, we're gonna maintain this. It's gonna be a very subtle, slow ferment. So we'll maintain those aromatics into that uh, final product and it should be better because of it. So let's do that. So we, we've already experimented with and made products uh, combining cherry juice with cider. And in this case, we're combining a 10% element of cherry juice and cider. And if you really want to determine which is the best uh, percentage of cherry juice and cider or whatever juice you're using, you're gonna to have to experiment with fermenting out several different blends of that. But in this case, we already know 10% is good. So let's do that, okay? That's our target. So we've already measured out uh, based on the volume of cider we have here in this uh, carboy. This is a one gallon carboy. Uh, we have uh, the 10% element of cherry juice and we're just gonna add it in. And we should see some activity on this. Now remember, this is a, there's still live yeast in this cider. Uh, there's not as much as when we began the process, but there's still a lot of live yeast there. So this should reinvigorate the yeast. Uh, we should see some slight subtle bubbling on the surface within a couple days, if not sooner. Uh, yeah, go ahead and give that a swirl there, Steve. Okay. Just make sure that's uh, nicely mixed. And not only are you mixing the juice there, but you're also uh, mixing the yeast or any lees in the bottom, and you're getting that yeast to be activated inside that, uh, that liquid. And you can see those yeast chunks start to, to get riled up from the bottom, and that's good. You might do this more than once uh, to get that re-ferment started. Right. Okay. And if it's not, you know, after a couple days, if you're not seeing any activity there, you could always pitch more yeast. There's no harm in that either. Um, it might be that the colony is so, so low or so depleted that it's just not going to activate very well. So maybe add some more yeast if you need to, or it wouldn't hurt, hurt, it wouldn't hurt to do that now either. Yeah, so we'll wait until this ferments out and then we'll package it. And, and it will be as a dry product with a co-ferment, a little bit more on the wine-like side. But probably a lot of people see in stores and at liquor stores and 
and, and cideries, uh, more of a back sweetened uh, uh, fruited cider product. So, you know, maybe now's a good time to talk about how we would go about figuring out how much uh, juice to add for back sweetening, right? Sure. Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. When you're back sweetening with juice, the most important part is how much juice are you going to use? Just like that experiment at the refrigerator that got me started on making a mango cider, right? You have to decide how much, this is probably the question everybody has right now, how much do you use? In a general sense, Colin, it's probably, I think you've said something along the lines of five to 15%. Yeah, that's, that's probably a good rough parameters uh, to start with, but the real answer to that question is probably you should add as much as you like to taste. And that involves some experimentation. Uh, it involves what's called a bench trial, which we're gonna go through right now and talk about. Uh, but you really wanna know what you like, because many people are, everybody's different. You're gonna like a little more cherry, maybe I like a little less, and we're gonna wanna find out what we wanna make. And that, right? and that kind of goes a little, that five to 15% kind of goes to our philosophy a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Basically, we, we when we're using fruit, we wanna make a fruited cider, not, just a fruit wine. So if, if we're making a fruited cider, our goal is always to, to try to get the qualities of the cider still present, but adding the influence of the fruit. So that's kind of our philosophy. Right. You might have a different philosophy. You can do it differently, right? I mean, we could, we could make a cherry wine if we wanted to and sure. skip the cider completely. That's a whole other ball game. But in this case, like you said, we want some subtle flavors and aromatics to that good cider without overpowering it to the point where you don't know their cider anymore. And so we have another video on back sweetening and uh, we're not gonna go through the mechanics of packaging a back sweetened product. Uh, we're just gonna show you what we do, Colin referred to a bench trial, to decide how much of that to put in here for, for your taste. So what have you done here, Colin? Okay. What have you set up for us? So let, let's say, so we're now at the end of our process of fermentation. Um, we have a beautiful dry cider, and we've decided we wanna make it into a cherry cider, and we're not sure how much to add. But this is just gonna be for flavor, just for, gonna be for a little bit of back sweetening, get, kind of round it out. And so we've now, I, I've mixed this up for sake of uh, brevity, for a 5% uh, cherry juice with cider, and a 10% cherry juice with cider, and a 15% cherry juice with cider. Uh, you know, first thing I notice, is they're different, right? I can see visually, this one's a little bit lighter mm -hmm. pinkish. Mm -hmm. uh, get to the 15% over here and it's definitely got that deep burgundy kind Very of color noticeable. to it. So I know there's gonna be some differences not only in color, but also probably flavor as well. And I see that you put some tape on that. Is that important? It is, if you're gonna do a lot of this, right? Now, this is actually kind of a simple bench trial, but many times you might be doing, you know, 10 different versions of something and you're gonna need to remember which one's which when you're tasting. So. I just, that's a simple way to do that. So. Now, here comes the fun part, right? <laughs> so, w w I'm gonna start with the with the 5% uh, blend. Is that, is that yeah, a good you idea, Yeah, you'd wanna start with the lesser uh, concentrate because the stronger cherry element will, will, in a sense, drown out your taste buds and you wouldn't, it would interfere with your tasting of the other products. So start with the simple and get to the higher concentrate as you go through, so. Okay, we're trying the 5%. And I will say that's pretty subtle. I'd say it tastes a little more like cider to me without much cherry influence. Yeah. Would you agree? I get a little bit of the cherry on the aromatic. I don't get very much cherry on the flavor. Mm -hmm. And I think in our purposes here, we're gonna wanna go a little bit higher than that. So I'm gonna leave that behind. Moving on. Let's try the 10. And you know, smell it, look at it, you know, Take in every aspect of this that you're trying, just you know, to get the full idea of what it's like. I do notice a little difference there. Uh, still pretty subtle. I would say still uh, pretty subtle, yeah, for but, sure. But uh, it's got a nice, a uh, little bit more of a cherry essence to mm -hmm. it. Um, you can definitely tell there's cherry in there. Right, no so that one's, that one's a contender, I would say at this point. Right, let's we'll try, try a 15%. 15%. And this one's definitely darker, as we said. You can see that. Aromatics are pretty similar. I gotta tell you, 
I'm kind of liking the 15. That's pretty good. That's yeah. pretty good. I like I like a little bit more of it. It's still not. It still is a cider. Clearly, mm -hmm. it has the subtlety. A little bit of tannins from the cherry. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that tartness. Uh, certainly some sweet. Uh, I think that might be the winner right there. Um, and I'm we, with you. And if we let's say we weren't convinced that any of these are the good are good place to end. We might do a 20%. We mm -hmm. might do, if we felt like 10 to 15 were not quite right, but something in between, we might end up doing a, a 10, 11, and a 12% and find out what we think about that. So yep. you can dial this down as much as you want or as little as you want uh, to see what you're gonna end up adding as your final product. So now we added 10% to this. We know that's gonna be pretty subtle, right? Yep, yep. So yeah. we might end up back sweetening that later. And uh, that, that's a, I'm glad you raised that. You can do both, right? Right, you can co-ferment. You could back sweeten at the end for a little bit of fruitiness. Uh, you can do all these things together, separately, however you want to do it. Actually, that's a really good segue. That's a really good segue. <laughs> so we have one here that we serve at number 12. It's called Black Market. And that is both a cold ferment and a little back sweetening with a black currant, right? Sure. Yeah, this is a uh, black currant cider. It's, uh, we, we do the secondary ferment, cold ferment. So, in other words, we go through the initial ferment on the cider, we add the black currant as its own element after that first phase is over. Uh, so we maintain the aromatics, which is one thing you'll notice about this is it has this sort of jammy aroma to it, just this wonderful kind of berry quality uh, that's maintained because of that secondary cold ferment. It's and really then we'll come back in with, with just a little bit of sweetener at the end, a hint of, of some black currant juice. And that kind of just livens the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. uh, it finishes as a semi-dry, so it's not very sweet, uh, but it has a beautiful fruit essence to it. Yeah, it's a fantastic, award-winning, very popular cider here. Uh, so maybe that's a good time for us to, uh, to sign off, huh? Good luck with your fruit cider making, everybody. Happy cider making. Cheers. Cheers.